well hello and welcome back to A Boat Called Wanda. So I've had some time out to reflect and to dust myself off and I figure I just need to get back here and back on the bike and uh, keep going despite the sort of bad uh, news I had in the last update with things not going as well as I'd hoped. So I think for now the next part of the project is I can focus on probably the beneath the waterline jobs. Um, okay, so I didn't get the top sides painted, you know, I've missed my opportunity for this year, but at least everything's primed, it's waterproof, um, all the uh, holes and everything in the deck have been covered over. So if I can now focus on what I need to do beneath the waterline to get it waterproof, then at least I can, uh, you know, quickly make up some hatches and port light covers and take Wander outside and, you know, in nine months' time, I can probably bring it back to the shed to get it painted if that's where I am this time next year. So in terms of the work beneath the waterline, there's one final repair up here that I need to do, a bit of laminate work. And this is obviously where Wanda's um, hit that reef. And obviously I've done all the um, topside repair uh, and all the repairs along here, which was where you know, she scraped along the side of the reef. I also need to do some work on this rudder, on the skeg. Um, this is all just filler, and it looks like it's filler over anti-fouling. And again, I think it's a bit of a bodgy repair when one to hit the reef, and I think the bottom got knocked off. So this is just all really crap. Um, so yeah, I need to get rid of all that filler and relaminate the skeg, I think. Um, that housing's come off. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but that needs a bit of work done to it. Now, you may remember me saying a few weeks back that I had a hole in my boat that I needed to fix. And that's basically this um, crack along here, which is about 70 mil by about 5 mil wide. And it's basically just underneath the, the um, keel right at the back here. So we're sort of, yeah, there. Now, the reason why I thought this was actually a hole is that when I get a light under here, I can see some, um, some metal. And I got a drill ages ago and sort of drilled up here and could see that I was drilling into metal. So I always assumed that this was actually the bottom of the fuel tank. Um, so when I pulled the fuel tank out, I expected to see broad daylight showing through here. But it's not. So... Um, Rob suggested that this might be like a stainless steel sort of plate along the bottom to um, sort of give it a little bit more strength in case it ever hit a reef, which is exactly what it did. So it sort of stops all the laminate from crumbling away because there's this stainless steel barrier here. So that's what it could be. But anyway, this will need to be opened up and sort of feathered back and, and relaminated. Quite a few things to do beneath the waterline before I can then get her uh, copper coated. Um, and then the top sides and beneath the waterline will all be watertight and I can take Wonder outside. So that's the plan. So first up, I think today, I'm going to use the planer and take a little bit more gel coat off the top up near where the engine mounts are and uh, take it from there. So let's get back into it. So that's what this side of the hull looks like now. I've just used the planer to get a little bit higher and I mean the good thing is that's basically right there is under the uh, engine beds and the laminate looks really good there. It's um, clean and there's you know nothing coming through so it looks pretty solid and at least reading from the outside the moisture levels are good. So I don't have to worry so much about that. I don't think there's anything critically wrong with the laminate there. Well, there's a couple of small jobs that I've got to do here in the engine room that'll help prepare for the uh, beneath the waterline work. The first one is I've got this through hole here which I want to close up. So I think this was for the original Volvo Penta engine and perhaps the water inlet was all at the back of the engine. But with the Yanmar, uh, the, all the water pump and everything is right at the front which will sit there. So first of all you've got this long line running all the way to the back here. 
the second problem is you sort of have to reach up and over the engine and um, that big dry riser to get your hand back here. It's really awkward. Um, and then finally you're sort of leaning behind this one here, which is the cockpit drain. So really hard to get your hand here. So I'm going to move that forward to a location up front here somewhere. First up is to close up this through hole here. I found some sort of delaminated tabbing around here as well. So I've just opened that up and I'm going to tab back here. And then there was this other little fix here, which is up. This is a sort of lip where that uh, cockpit floor screws into and there's been some delamination here. So I, I've um, cut all of that back, as you can see. I need to put a filler there and then I'll put some uh, epoxy tabbing around it. Now to fill up that through hole, I'm going to go the other way around where the largest piece is the first piece you put down and then you work back to the smallest piece. And I'm going to put that on the peel ply and just then put the whole piece on. to talk a little bit more about my plan to make the fuel tank in the space in the kill. So a few weeks ago I was all set on getting a stainless steel fuel tank built so just as I was about to go off and order the stainless steel material I saw one of the uh, viewers had posted a comment saying why don't you just make your own uh, fuel tank in the kill cavity and I was about to sort of write back to them to say well it's not really a great idea um, and I started to think about it and I couldn't really reason why it wasn't a good idea. I guess I felt that, you know, I'm dealing with this problem of getting diesel out of the bilge and laminate, so the thought of putting diesel in there as an integral fuel tank seemed a bit wrong. But the more I thought about it, the better idea it, it seemed to be for, for many reasons. The first thing is, it's actually pretty simple. The back end over here is uh, closed up, so all I'd need is a lid coming along the top here um, and a front to the tank and then a couple of baffles in here. So um, it's going to be pretty simple to put together. I don't have to worry about trying to marry up a irregular sort of curved shape to that square um, stainless steel tank and try and find a way of tabbing all that in. Um, it's going to be a lot cheaper. I've costed up the materials and it's probably going to cost me about uh, 350 to 400 pounds versus 1100 pounds for the um, stainless steel one. Um, and I can do it all myself so I've got complete control over the process. I can get it exactly the way I want and I can probably maximize the space in here that I can use to store fuel. Yeah so that's really exciting and I'm really pleased that somebody suggested to me hey why not use this for a fuel tank because I just wouldn't have thought of it so thanks for that. Okay so my next step is to work out how I'm going to build it and what construction materials I'm going to use. So for the top lid and the front I wanted to have something that was relatively strong and had some good heat resistance to you know fire or things like that so I've ended up going with some G10 laminate some six millimeter thick G10 laminate for the internal baffles I'll probably make three baffles I'm just going to use marine ply and obviously I need to be very very careful that that marine ply is perfectly encapsulated with the resin to make sure that um, the, the diesel is impervious to it so that's the material for making the lid, the front and the three internal baffles. So next thing is to look at what sort of resins I've got here and which ones I can go with. So basically what I've got here in the workshop, my favourite go-to resin is epoxy uh, because it's easy to use and it's really strong, get a really good mechanical bond. Uh, vinyl ester from what I have left over from the beneath the waterline repairs and some of the deck. And finally polyester resin which I've also used for some parts of the deck. Um, now, the first thing I can do is take polyester away because I've actually seen from first-hand experience what diesel can do to polyester when it gets uh, beneath the tabbing and is sort of delaminated. 
So that's gone. So my favorite company is West System and I, I really like epoxy. So I just emailed them to let them know that I was going to make a diesel fuel tank using epoxy and was there any concerns or issues. And um, I got a really good response from them. I got an email back within two days with a, a telephone number for a person to talk to. And they shared with me an article that the Gujon brothers had produced. The Gujon brothers are the sort of West System um, corporate family, I think. And what they actually said is they couldn't advocate using their epoxy anymore as a diesel fuel tank um, material. And the reason for that is they're concerned by the amount of ethanol that they're starting to see in fuels and the uncertainty of what components can be introduced via biofuels, particularly into diesel. So already um, there is biodiesel out there everywhere you go. Um, and there is also starting to get a, a, a blend of uh, ethanol in some diesels. I know that in Europe, for example, in Germany, they're manufacturing a blended uh, ethanol diesel. And with, when the Goujon brothers did all their tests, they discovered that um, a solution with up to 10% ethanol will actually break down their epoxy um, after 28 days of saturation. So they just can't advocate it anymore due to the unknown future of biofuels and diesel. So that was a real uh, disappointment for me, so I had to take that off the list. But then I looked into it a little bit further and there's another type of epoxy that they do use for um, fuel tanks, diesel fuel tanks and chemical tanks, and that's a phenolic Novolac epoxy. So there's a product out there called um, Tank Guard and a couple of other um, products, that's a Joton product. And they use tank guard commercially for lining the insides of cargo ships or any sort of vessel or container that's storing diesel. So this looked to be like the thing that I should be using. Once I did some research on it, I found two problems. First of all, it's very expensive and it only comes in, you know, 200 kilogram drums. Uh, and the second problem with it is none of the manufacturers have got uh, test evidence to show it working with substrates, fiberglass. And the reason they don't have any of that is because um, for all the commercial tanks, they're using either concrete or steel, and so that's what they do their testing on. So for those two reasons, I decided that I'd have to take off the epoxy, the phenolic novalic epoxy. So that left me with vinyl ester. Now, I'd heard that they'd made uh, diesel tanks or encapsulated tanks and kills out of vinyl ester, you know, all through the 80s. So this was probably going to be a good bet. Before I started, I rang up a company called Scott Bader, who are one of the largest manufacturers of vinyl ester, and I let them know my requirements, what I was going to do, and they recommended not necessarily the vinyl ester that I've got in the, in the shed here, but a special type of uh, resin that's specifically designed for high temperatures and, and chemicals, and in particular, it can withstand uh, diesel and ethanol, so any combination of ethanol this uh, material will stand up to. So they gave me the product number for that, it's uh, 474, but interestingly enough, it's not vinyl ester, it's not epoxy, it's actually a polyester resin. It is a highly cross-linked polyester resin, but it's still basically uh, a polyester. So this is what I've bought or ordered up, and this is what I'm going to go with. And um, according to all the specifications that I've read, this is uh, what they use commercially for um, building um, pipes and um, constructing a composite that is good for um, you know, ethanol and, and um, highly solvent chemicals. So this is it. That's what I'm going to do. So I've ordered everything up. I can start to get some templates cut out to work out the size of the baffles and the top and the front. And I'm going to build my own fuel tank in the uh, keel of my boat using a special type of polyester resin and G10 fiberglass sheets. OK, well, I've got a little bit more work to do in here. I've just put some plastic here to separate the section because that's all good. That's ready to have the um, seacock uh, bases installed and then basically to, to paint that area. So I want to keep it relatively dust free. But for now I need to come back and uh, get rid of more of this damp wood that's down there. It actually goes all the way to the bottom. And I think this, this wood is so damp that it's also probably interfering with the moisture meter when I'm on the outside of the hull. 
Um, so just to avoid any confusion, it's probably best to get rid of all of that now. Yeah, it's really damp, really wet. Well that was a terrible job and as you can see here by all the tools it took a lot of combination of different things to get out but uh, here we go there's still like little residues of wood here and there but that's okay basically I've sort of got all the damp wood out so I can see what's going on here and uh, what I need to do is bash this out I'll show you why I need to do that a little bit later on. So that's the through hole that I patched up and then I also put a few sheets of um, biaxial over it to, uh, to redo the tabbing because the tabbing was a little bit compromised. Well folks, check this out. I was just pottering around in the bilge and um, I just noticed that I could get an edge behind this tabbing. Um, so I just, you know, got a chisel behind it and sure enough the whole thing pulled back and water came out and then this side as well you can see this here it's that real sort of stinky chemical smelling water like it's full of styrene so god knows god knows if there's ever going to be an end to problems with this boat or if it's just going to be one thing after another until i give up so here this is the water tank so i'm just wondering now if um you know, with all the bumps and knocks and things Wanda's had that the water tank had leaked also. So this is the bottom of the water tank here and then this is like a channel that goes underneath to allow any water from the front of the boat to come down to the bilge. So I'm wondering if it was sitting between the tank and this, like at the bottom of the tank. Well, I don't know. I think I need to leave it for now. It's doing my head in a bit. Time to go home. Well having this white suit on can only mean one thing and you guessed it it's time for some more grinding fun so yeah probably three or four hours in there i want to get all that tapping out and see if i can find any more traces of water and i really hope that's the last time i have to get into that ultra confined space with a grinder or a um, sander or a filer or anything because i just really want to put this to bed so that i can just let it dry out and come back to it okay Oh, well, that was absolutely horrible, and it's not finished. And I tried uh, to I tried to go and go until it was done, and it's probably in there for about six hours. So uh, yeah, as you can see, it ain't pretty. You know, it's not all beer and skittles. This glamorous sailboat restoration life, you do end up looking pretty stupid at times like this. Uh, yeah, so it's time for a shower and a beer. Well, I'm back after taking a couple of days break from uh, coming down here. Following that last heavy duty grinding session, I needed some time out to recover. That was probably about um, eight hours one day and seven hours the day before, so 15 hours solid of uh, grinding in that bilge area. So it's all done now. It was very, very time consuming because of the difficult space that I had to crawl into. And obviously at times you're working with the uh, grinding disc a couple of inches away from your face, you know, hanging upside down. So it does take a bit of concentration and you need to be a little bit careful. Anyway, that's done. So let's go up and take a look at uh, how it's turned out. Right, well I've had this heater in here for the last couple of days and I've just sealed this up with plastic to, you know, just try and add a little bit of heat and dry air to help things along. That smells warm. Right, so things look a little bit cleaner, whiter. You can see this part here looks good. It's really white and clean. Now this was interesting because 
um, it had all this grey sort of cement filler here and then that grey came down here in a very very thin line and then there was tabbing over the top so there was like a sandwich with the grey in the middle and so basically I took all that old tabbing off the top and got rid of the grey and that's the sort of residual part of the tabbing which I've left because it looked okay so all of this has been opened up and all the tapping has been removed so we're back to the original bare glass I mean it's still far from perfect but it does look a lot cleaner there's no or less sort of brown dark grey oil stain so I used the planer and probably took about two millimeters off and then the grinder to do the rest so I've, I've taken a good two mils off the surface I think well that's all I've got time for unfortunately for this week so I'm gonna to have to end the update here um, I am feeling pretty positive about everything again the keel has really dried out ever since I planed or sat, um, ground back that outside two millimeters so already in the space of a week I've seen the levels drop radically I think all I need to do is actually put a heater in that keel and seal it up and probably in three or four weeks time it's going to be perfect. So that's coming along well. I've got all my materials here to make that fuel tank and I'm really looking forward to that. I've got all my other seacock bits and pieces so I can start to put them round. Um, and the beneath the waterline stuff is, is just starting to kick off. So uh, big news is uh, later on this week there's another project coming up into my life. and. Uh, this project is probably going to take a lot more time uh, than Wonder and cost a hell of a lot more as well. So I think I'm going to have my hands pretty busy with this new project, at least for the next 18 years. So I'm not really sure um, how I'm going to work on Wanda um, in the near future and beyond that. Obviously, I'm also desperately trying to find a job and hopefully something will come up pretty soon. Um, so bottom line is, I'm not sure when I'm going to be back on Wanda. Um, I do intend to finish it, but it might take some time. So if you've been enjoying the um, series up to this point and you're interested in knowing what happens next, then uh, again, I'd advise you to subscribe. Once I'm back online, you'll get a notification and um, I'll pick this up again at a later stage. Okay, thanks for watching. See you soon.